imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. With your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though... If you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with shot and nail. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's so that you still do my life to. That's okay. It means something. It means something. That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, 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 is a science thing. It is science waste. It's a scientific fact. And we are all up in your face. It is time once more for the one, the only, Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it. Episode 202. 202. Oh, it's palindrome. It's palindrome time, baby. Uh, it's not a requirement for Fight a High Fight to be on palindrome shows. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, Jeff Mueller from Juno 44, Shipping News, uh, Rodan, Dexterity Press, all kinds of cool stuff. It's been a couple years since they had them on. I think there had been some Juno 44 stuff happening, but not at the same level that there eventually was. Uh, of course, then the pandemic happened. But we'll get into all that, we'll get into all that, we'll get into all that. Looking forward to it. Thanks, everybody, for the kind words about the 200th episode and just the, I guess, this is just the general kind words in, in general. General kind words in general. Sure. It's, uh, it's a crazy time to be alive, and it, it means a lot to me that this show means something to you guys. And, uh, that's, that's just an earnest statement. So, uh, the episodes are still uh, somewhat backlogged. Patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal if you have not, uh, if you see an episode that you wanted to see, but uh, if you're missing an episode that you want to see, it's probably or here, whatever, I don't know. That's the thing. A dollar a month probably will get you there. Yeah, whatever. It is what it is. Uh, yeah, otherwise, ProtonicReversal.com for the archives, my place to find podcasts. Thanks so much for spreading it around. Get the YouTube is woefully out of date. The Protonic Reversal computer took a big fat electronic dump, so that'll be changing soon, uh, in a good way. But uh, we'll, we'll get back on the YouTube. So let's uh, yeah, let's, let's listen to this song and we'll talk to Jeff. Yeah, it's awesome. Excited.
All right, that's a little that's a little of information and belief for you there by a little band known as Juno 44. That's a, off of the Four Great Points record. Oh, hey, that's professional radio hey, show here. And right now we have none other than Mr. Jeff Mueller. How you doing, sir? Welcome. You got you got a Jeffy. You got you you got your Jeff, <laughs> your your biggest fan, Jeff Mueller. Hey man, how are you? Dude, How's it's going? it's so good to talk to you. It's it's I it really is it's actually <laughs> I I mean, you should say that after we. You should say that after we talk. Oh, We've that's just true. gotten started. That's there's a lot to sort of. There's a lot to kind of go over. You might actually end up like wanting to cut my face after this conversation. You might hate me. I see what you do. I, I, I hope not. How are you? Good, good. Uh, well, you know, as well as can be expected in absolute hell world, of course. Oh come on, come on, lighten up, <laughs> lighten up, come on. <laughs> That's uh, no it, way to go. Come on, it's. I mean, it sucks, yes, but there's, there, there's, there's, there's got to be something. I mean, there's got to be something. There is joy. There, there, there's, there's, there's plenty to be happy about. I'm, I'm just, I'm just being a, being a curmudgeon because I didn't sleep very well last night. Uh, how are you doing? That's the important question. Nobody cares how I'm doing. How are you doing? Um, how are you doing? Uh, you know, tr- truth be told, I'm, I'm. Thank you for asking. I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well, honestly. Like my uh, things are, things are kind of moving along. Actually, today, uh, you know, like it's hard to sort of get up and leave like your station right now certainly where i am because we've been pretty much pinned in since march and following following pandemic protocols and all that kind of stuff so we just force ourselves to kind of pull our pull pull ourselves away from work and and do things and today like my daughter and i we go on these expeditions looking for yeah we do we go looking for creatures and stuff and she's been wanting a turtle and today i I walked to the post office to send a bunch of stuff and on my way home uh, on the side of the on the side of our little street there was a a cute little spotted turtle so picked it up brought it home and and she got she got fully emotional it was great that's awesome it was good it was good that's like the lesser known uh, novel uh, turtle spotting that is uh you know irvine welsh Yes. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. So no, but but no, but um, but things that you know, we, I guess like when did when did we talk? Did we talk in twenty eighteen? It's actually I'm trying, I'm actually trying to figure that out. It was twenty. It was about two years, like year and a half. I feel like it ago. was in like yeah. I feel like it was in July or August around this time two years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, and it, it's it's one of those things where I was actually thinking about that today, and despite having the ability to look up that information very easily, I just for whatever reason decided I would just like kind of grind on it. I'm like, I don't know. When was that? Hmm, I don't know. Like just kind of worked on and worked on. I never came up with an answer, but I think it's yeah, just I, about two years. It feels like it was about two years um, to me. I like guess. And I, um, I was, I was considering like wearing the same outfit and yeah, July 2018. The same... It's a two yeah. year two. So two years and one month episode one twenty. Yeah. 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 There we go. Okay. Yeah, there I could have it done is. That all day, and I totally didn't. Uh. What'd you do? Did you just search it? Did you just search your your database yeah, or something just, like I, that? Yeah, I am, since I'm right at the computer, it was like, oh, which episode was it? Okay, it was that one. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, but I, you know, I was gonna go, I was gonna go to my uh, my side porch and sit in the precise location that I talked to you because <laughs> I can see it like it happened yesterday. But I went out there, I went out there about ten minutes ago or fifteen minutes ago, and I felt like. A, friggin salad bar the mosquitoes oh yeah. they just they love me like my back looks like a like a like a like a like a an ugly fluke or like a, some sort of like a like a lychee nut or something because they just eat me they just eat every little piece of me and i hate it and i just can't so anyway i uh i, I went back inside the house and i found a comfy chair so you have like appetizing blood, basically, is what you're, is what you're telling people. No, not that. You know, this 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 might be get me in trouble. Uh, but you know, I'm as far as people like who sort of scrutinize and and, and judge these types of conversations. Uh-huh. But I'm gonna but I'm gonna take a risk. I you know I liken myself. I'm Jewish. Mm-hmm. I'm Jewish. Okay, and I liken mosquitoes to being little flying Hitlers, <laughs> and they just. They just like to. They just want to just chew on <laughs> chew on my Jewness. They just love my Jewishness. So little flying so, Hitlers, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I just want to just squash them. I just want to just not have them near yeah, me. I don't. Um, think any, I think anyone's sad if that happens. To be clear, I don't think anyone's gonna be mad that that's. Oh, I, I, I hope not. But you know, like any reference nowadays, it just seems like it could be. You know, <laughs> you can just like flip things any which way. I could somehow become. Uh, suddenly, like like scrutinized and 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 thrown in jail for being anti mosquito. Yeah, I could be you? like, I'm anti mosquito. 
You know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to kill the bats. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. I'm trying to deprive the bats of their food. Yeah. Um, They're a valuable anyway. part of the ecosystem, you animal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyway, anyway. Well, I think um, last last we talked, you had done a few of the Juno 44 shows uh, overseas, over, over over in Italy. Uh, that was, like, still relatively recent, and there was kind of nebulous, perhaps, uh, future plans for, for stuff, uh, including yeah, domestically here in the U.S. But I know for a fact that you played Chicago, specifically because I had tickets to it and didn't go to it because I was too busy canvassing instead, and uh, I... I wish I could have seen it, but that that said, I feel like it was a valuable uh, use of my time. Uh, I get it. I get it. Well, no, that's an important thing to be doing. I didn't realize you were in Chicago. Well, I'm in Milwaukee, uh, so uh, that was that was the closest yeah. one. So you know, hour forty five drive, aka okay, down the street. You know, <laughs> <laughs> through Kenosha, you got to be careful. You got to go by Mars's cheese. You got to go by Mars the cheese, cheese castle. castle yeah. too. it was interesting yeah. seeing Mars Cheese Castle trending on Twitter for a while. I'm like, huh. That's that not something that. Oh, because they yeah they, yeah they stepped into they stepped into it didn't they didn't they have some they had some like some commentary they got they got all political on us about something I can't remember precisely what it was. Did the cheese castle? Oh, I'm, I'm, I hope not. I, I know that like the uh, the uh, as he was referred to the aspiring cop kid that uh, shot the protesters. Uh, talked about, you know, he was on the Facebook page talking about Stormy in the Cheese Castle, which was like, okay, yeah. Oh, that would have been no, a lot cuter that... if you hadn't actually killed some people. But Oh, God, no, right? No, no, no this was this was more, this was not that recent. This was more like um, more like half a year ago. I think they... Maybe they did. God, my, my, I feel like my... <laughs> I feel they like... Went, it was good commentary. It was just sort of like, sort of like the Wiener Circle in Chicago. It was sort of like their marquee sign. It was something... Oh. Oh, Something man. sort of aggressive, like anti, anti, like like right wing stuff. But I can't remember precisely what it was. I never anyway. understand why businesses do that. But then, by the same token, I was thinking about it, and I used to live like right up the hill from the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, and uh, which is just notoriously outspoken. Like they were known for like when Michael Mortar. Uh, when that when the movie they gave the which one was it they gave the R rating to and so like it wouldn't get shown anywhere and they're like we're not going to enforce the R rating. Um, a Michael Moore movie? Yeah, Fahrenheit 9/11. This is like years. oh yeah 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 yeah. But like they yeah, yeah. but basically they had like a big audacious I don't even remember what they said but they they changed their billboard to be you know we're not you know come see it we're not enforcing it and then the, then they just kind of like let it roll and had increasingly incendiary. And increasingly niche political messaging, including like things about parking meters and stuff, where it's like, okay, whoa, this is uh, you're, uh, you're, you're getting they, away they, from they universalist on, sentiment they, here and kind of getting more into like <laughs> to niche grievance. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, local grievances. It's like small town news. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's like a human interest story. No, I, it's not. It's not that. I mean, not, they, they, Marses didn't do that. Nor does the Wiener Circle. It's more like. It's more like like the onion esque. It's more like yeah, satirical, yeah. but sort of just like taking stabs. I don't know, and I, I'm for that. But yeah, you, I, I I I totally, I totally hear you. Like oh, it's and- almost like when you step into a protest, and instead of it being, does it like one like the reason of the protest sort of splinters out into a like like you're talking about free Mumia and Monsanto in the same, <laughs> like, in the like, same brother, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just here to see Ant-Man. <laughs> right, right. I know. That's exactly. It's like, well, stop it. You're like, come on, just kind of get clear, clarify. It just needs to be kind of cleared out a little bit, but it, it's all useful. And I don't know. Uh, I, I guess. So I just looked it up while, while we were, um, while we were talking and, and apparently they, on January of this year, they just, they put up, I can't breathe. On the uh, on the billboard. Oh, that. Uh, uh, oh, wait. Wiener Circle did that. Uh, March Cheese Castle did. That's what it was. Then you nailed it. Yeah, you found it. And, yeah. they, and this article also notes it as a lactose landmark, which I feel like is a good alliteration and a usage of, of headline space. So. Huh. Yeah, that's t- that's that's intense, man. And I, th- I think, yeah, honestly, like in my view, certainly coming from that neck of the woods and that region of the country, I think it's important for that type of messaging that type of clear and concise messaging at this point to sort of have some resonance and to have some presence. I don't think it's, but you know, again, like if it, if it goes from, you know, I can't breathe to, 
uh, you know, the parking meters suck in my neighborhood. Like, <laughs> yeah. let's just that, 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 that. Lift, lift the the two hour yeah. parking ban. Well, okay, that's right, right. No right on red and left turn should be illegal. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, it's like, yeah. But I mean, if it, you know, like, I I think that the those places and those places, I think it's useful for them to sort of use okay. some of their leverage to platform those types of messages uh, without it becoming too preachy. And it's risky. It's risky. I mean, they could just basically be, you know, like, I mean, they could be turning away like a third to half of their business if they by 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 taking that type of position and stance. So it's ballsy, but I think it's really crucial and uh, important for people to sort of see that people that feel sort of beaten up and yeah. ostracized or like they have no voice or no one's really paying any attention. And particularly particularly right now because we're all sort of wearing masks and not able to see each other's faces unless we're carrying large guns. I've got so many guns. I've got so many guns. I've, my house is just filled. I can't even move in my house because it's filled with guns. <laughs> Tri- tripping over guns? <laughs> I'm just tripping over guns. No, no, it's not true. It's not true. Uh, yeah, um, well, well I, think, I think you hit some important points there, and I think it's something where... yeah, And that's something that it, it's bizarre to me that that's become... You know, statements of solidarity like that can be seen as political messaging rather than, you know, if someone put up all cops are bastards or something, it's like, okay, you're drawing the line right there, you know, which uh, it would be understandable where people would be upset. But like the people seem to be there's there's a lot of folks that seem to be professionally upset about shit. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah that, well and there's a lot of that well well there's a lot of fodder for that too. I mean, um, I don't know how much we got back how much we got into this the first time that we talked but i mean honestly and for the first for the first two years of trump's term like i found myself showing up to work and just not knowing what to do with myself yeah. for the first certainly for the first six months or a year i just showed up and i needed to just kind of sit down and 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 just weed through my headspace and i would just write these op-eds and i would just send them out to nowhere which just i need mean, just to get it out of my system Right, right. Like the, um, the act of uh, getting it out into the light being the, the ultimate goal. Like not necessarily having like an end goal of like, I'm going to have this published in whatever. It's like, nope, it's getting it out there. It's just getting it out there. And it's like bubble politics. You know, it's all very bubble politic oriented. And I just was just, I, 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 I found myself in a rabbit hole with it. And I still feel precisely the same way that I did. But at the end of the day, there's only so much that I can do or say, you know, there's only so many letters I can write or so many protests and demonstrations I can sort of participate in before I start to sort of affect. It has an adverse effect on the things that surround me that I really care about. At the end of the day, like none of those people, the good or the bad people, they don't really give a shit about me and they don't really care about my relationships with people that are stressed as a result of some of, of, of decisions that are beyond my control. They don't care. So... I kind of need to needed to sort of dial it back and just kind of, you know, like pay attention to the things that were crucial to me that sort of keep 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 my part sort of pinned together. Because uh, for a while there, I was totally coming unhinged. I was just depressed and yeah. this sucks. And how can our country be like this? And it's only gotten worse. And honestly, it's only gotten worse. <laughs> yeah. But no, but, but 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 I think my 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 tack and honestly like. Uh, it's been really good to have, you know, you brought it like you uh, a couple minutes ago, a few moments ago, you mentioned, you know, like what was going to, you know, like after the first June of 44 dates back in, in May, uh, I think the first show back was sometime mid May in 2018. And I came home and then you and I talked in July. Yeah. We didn't, we weren't really certain and we're still not really 100% certain what, what we're doing. We're just sort of like taking it as it comes, but through the past, you know piece of change and time it's been really useful to have as much creativity and much art related focus to sort of prevent me from just sort of deteriorating you know yeah i mean because it seems like you've you've managed to keep a good balance of putting uh, that energy towards things that are positive like doing like uh, dexterity press stuff and 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 finding finding ways to kind of mitigate the, the the negative feelings and feelings of helplessness uh, through doing art. And that's something that, you know, I, I get a lot of messages from people about that. You know, I sometimes have that same, <laughs> that same level of anxiety about things. And it's, it's something where it's nice 
to see uh, people be able to make stuff in basically what is complete chaos all the time, as, as I would characterize it. And, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, it, you know, it, it, to, to an extent, like some of it, you know, some of the things are high, like I, 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 I could potentially be viewed as self-indulgent or sort of um, like just sort of like wrapped all around my own sort of like ideologies or thoughts or process or whatever. And other things like are entirely like that, like, like fixated on a broader spectrum that's totally outside of myself. But at the end, for me, the long and the short of it is it's just like in order to get a, a better metric on what uh, it is that I'm doing and how that relates to the people that I care about. Like I, it's just sort of like a continuous, I guess a continuous purge. It's just sort of continuous sort of like session. of just trying to get some things out of my system. So I feel like if I can't be really good for myself, then I'm not going to be able to be that awesome for my kids or my wife or, or those sorts of things. You know, the, the tricky part of it is that like it, it, within the scope of like my family, like, you know, I was, I just said a minute ago, like those people like that are calling the shots and that are making the rules, they don't really give a shit about us. And that, that, that ostensibly is sort of directed uh, within the scope of my own family because, you know, that, and I think there's a lot of people that probably everybody's sort of going through this in their own way. I, my, my story is no different than, many many other people as far as how they related to related with you know to the pandemic relating to the their how they re react and respond to like you know racial injustice and civil unrest and all these all the things that are at the top of our minds right now but it's just interesting to have people in my life you know and I, I, every and everyone shares this sort of sentiment i'm sure it's interesting to have people that are directly related to me that have completely opposite perspectives and an opposite view yeah. about how all of this stuff is going. It's like I, uh, uh, and, and that was part of part of why I sort of had to resist my inclination just to sort of like like throw shit sandwiches at everybody <laughs> for the first two years right. because I was hit. I was hitting people that I love too who don't share my perspective, and that's not, you know, like I, 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 no, it really isn't, and I don't want to, you know, like. I, you know, when all, you know, and hopefully this, you know, hopefully we come to a place where we're, we can all meet somewhere and have a more pluralistic sort of perspective on things, sort of, and a, a, a looser binding around us, but still a binding nonetheless. But, but until that day comes, I think we just need to be sort of protective about the things that are most important to us, because when that day comes, if we fuck everything up for ourselves, then we won't have anything left by the time, you know. So, and in some capacity, we won't have anything left until w w when things do clear out. Yeah, and you hit on some important points there. Uh, first thing I want to say is that I actually have been very interested in hearing people's stories of, of art as basically cathar catharsis and therapy, and just as a you know sanity, <laughs> almost a sanity prevention mechanism, but it was a sanity maintenance mechanism. <laughs> it's, it's, it's both. It's it, both. It, it can be both, depending on the art. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I did want to, I did want to notate that. But also, you know, we're, we're in a interesting situation that this was very predictable. I feel, and the reason why is because we've we allowed a situation where you have a facts versus frame environment everyone builds up stories and everything becomes about you know the the facts are all about chosen you know trusted sources and untrusted sources and these these stories that are told lakoff has a great book uh, don't think of an elephant that i always refer to yeah uh, that's like like the master work on this stuff but th i mean this has been this didn't happen by accident this this happened over the course of decades and yeah. this this is just the ultimate culmination of it. This this is like the payoff, right? This 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 is this is the uh, explosion at the fireworks factory. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the movie, and yeah, I, not to say that like that's like a desirable choice or anything, but considering that people just sort of who were in power decided to kind of keep a blind eye to it and just let people, oh ha ha ha, you know they're stupid because they can't spell this. Okay, but the thing is, do you realize that half the times they're spelling those wrong because they know that you're gonna be a dick about it? You know, like things along those yeah. lines. And, and it's like, and guess what? You kind of are being a dick. 
<laughs> like they're not yeah. wrong about that. Like you know, no. that doesn't mean abandon empathy. <laughs> but no, but it's also no, it, you know, it, it's a notable thing. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that uh, it, I, I don't like. I, I feel like what I what I try to do by and large is pay not pay much attention to what you know Reuters or what the Guardian or the, my news sources are telling me. And I'm trying not, and, but I, you know, I pay attention to them. I, you know, and I want, uh, you know, just to kind of bite into Fox News and bite into CNN. I try to get that perspective as well. But the, I, I really, I just am listening to what people are saying. I'm just trying to hear it. Like the story is sort of the story unfolds and it develops and it sort of tells itself if you just pay attention to, not the not the editorials, not the the bent media, but if you pay attention to what the people are saying, and uh, in, in many instances, a lot of the disparity and the sort of the dis- disproportionate sort of like leverage that people sort of invest in sort of like far left or far right media is based on them curating the 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 you know the answer to their own narrative. They try to they seek out the you know they're seeking out the the uh, an answer fits their their story and that and and that's always going to be poisonous you know that's always going to be poisonous if you're just sort of looking for the solution that 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 fits your unit that that best best fits your needs and yeah i i find that with my that and i guess that's it like when i was yeah when i'm talking about my team and people in my relatively close proximity that are you know that I that I that we don't fit 100% well these days. It's it's largely because they're just unwilling to sort of unwilling to sort of like accept like just the reality of of, of the circumstance. You know, and right yeah. now I'm actually really upset with you because I'm missing. <laughs> because, well, I am because I'm missing the RNC. I'm miss. I'm mad <laughs> that I'm not home. <laughs> that I can't go inside and just watch DJ Trump Jr. or whatever. I, I'm just angry. <laughs> Just, uh, just, re- just blowing uh, fat rails before he gives his uh, <laughs> have you watched speech. It, it, <laughs> it's so scary. It's so amazing. It's really kind of like watching WWF. It's like watching a, like a chair match or in a cage or like like watching a bunch of people throw thumbtacks all over a wrestling mat and just jump around in it. But did you did, did have you watched any of it? I have. I I I have generally watched as much as I could stand before I'm like I, I'm. Like screw this, I'm out. But there's been some incredible, like just from a sheer theatrical perspective, like Kimberly Guilfoyle's <laughs> presentation. Yeah. Like I, I wish that somebody, I can't remember who it was, they said you know they appreciated Pat Buchanan's speech, but they liked it better in the original German. And it was sort of, oh, oh yeah, wow, yeah, yeah that, that that would actually apply to. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's just basically doing everything but like pounding the pa- the the podium, and uh, it was like wow, this is a. Uh, this is this explain this to a founding father, you know, like okay. Yeah, totally. <laughs> this is, what, totally. What, what exactly? Okay, all right. And then everyone is it, it's sort of it's interesting to see the combination of the true believers and sort of the all long for the ride grifters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and just just yeah, I, I I, I, I there, there, at, at this point, it doesn't really seem like there's that much of a delineation between the two. There doesn't seem like there's that much of a line drawn between them. The yeah, they may not even know of, themselves at this point. It's like, it's like no, I don't even, no, no, do you no, believe no, this? Like, I don't even know anymore. You know, <laughs> right? Right? They could all just go fishing together, and there'd be no difference. There'd be like just, there's the, the adherence between the two just seem like the the, the line between reality and shape-shifting it just is all just sort of nestled sweetly into whatever it is that they feel like doing i don't know i don't know I've, i love you know, that I, they started recruiting people from like that, that were basically memes it's like oh we're gonna get the gun oh, couple we're gonna get that that kid that was rude to the uh american indian guy oh you mean you mean the st louis couple with the guns yeah it was like i was like you're just like, how the hell from why, memes the fuck, be... why the fuck are they on the rns <laughs> why are they there yeah. you couldn't find like i don't know an office holder to speak oh my gosh. or like someone like you know oh no we're gonna get the you know the, the people with the guns who like pointed the guns at the protesters oh my okay. gosh i know that's right if there's any way you're going to embo- like make make for more really great situations for people it's by sort of celebrating <laughs> like the yeah. suburban lunatics who held up ar-71s and hand pistols <laughs> protesters walking right. by their houses <laughs> in st louis it's great so it's only it's, it's just going to get better i um i uh, you know, for a while, 
uh, in the, I guess it was in the spring, you know, just as a fun thing, I started posting, I started making what I like to call my verified memes. Yes. I was making yeah, memes. Fan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just making my own verified memes that were just sort of like, just set up to kind of piss off Trump supporters. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was like, Jeff Mueller's dank meme stash for for. A yeah, time. I don't know. Like there were just like things that were completely wrong. Though they were completely yeah. untrue. It was like Trump signing an executive order to, uh, uh, for the immediate like um, release and, and, and imprisonment of police that you know were shooting people or whatever, and just making it look totally legit. Like, and I, don't, I, I never really had the the chops to kind of go forward with it, but I thought it would just be. There's just so much. There's so much of that, like of those those sorts of, those sorts of just like you know big white letters on a picture, sort of circulating through social media that people completely bite, sink their teeth into, and oh yeah, and and then suddenly it means something. It's like it just doesn't. It just really doesn't. My, my dad's my dad's like the meme lord, and you know maybe about forty percent of them are good or timely or funny, and there's a good twenty percent like I don't. I don't don't even understand what this is attempting to convey. It's just like, okay. Oh, yeah. He's just really I, well, into it. He loves it. I, I liked it when it was, I liked it when like we didn't think that like Trump was going to be president and his memes were funny. Now yeah, I just, no, I it's, can't. It's not funny. There's one like that after, I think it was after the second debate with Hillary Clinton where he, uh, he, he, you know, it was his Adderall sniffing festival. Like oh, he was yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And the meme is just like it, it basically like synchronizes all of his sniffles into like one like 30 second patch. It's just <laughs> it's a, I'll, it's a sniffle I'll, it, supercut. <laughs> it's just like one steady patch of Trump sniffles. And it's just just it's truly it, it really is. It's like I just could have it on repeat while I'm trying to go to sleep. It's like the right. best. Like, yeah, it's like, it's like it's like just the funniest thing. Uh, I don't know. What a world we live in. Yeah, Absolutely. Can you, uh, you know, I would like to actually hear a little bit how the uh, the revisionist adaptions of future histories in the time of love and survival thing came together. And also, I would like to talk about the fact that I like the survivor sound was uh, was involved in that because um, being an Oakland guy, that's a uh, I was like, yeah. oh, how cool! What like a neat crisscrossing of worlds. So, how did that come to pass? You got that Motmos remix. Uh, you got uh, McIntyre doing. I mean, it's kind of. I mean, it's in the title uh, to a certain degree, but like, wh- how did how were you th- how did that come together to to make this new release? Like, what was the mindset behind it? How did you decide what to pick? Like, where where did how did it all come to be? Well, for, for, do you, do you know do you know the Survivor Sound guy? Do you know Jonah? I do. Yeah, I, I got a futon from him. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> and I'm I still sure have it. It's I'm a sure great he futon. slept on it a few times. <laughs> um, I, no, we were we were. Uh, like I think it, I it, bought it, a copy before I even realized that he was involved. I'm like, oh, sh- no kidding, it's Joe. <laughs> that's awesome. No, oh, that's remarkable. Like he he was he was awesome. Like well, it honestly like the maybe like within weeks or like, a couple of months after we played in Catania. Sean, Sean uh, started saying we should, uh, re, you know, like revisit some of our older songs that we just were never satisfied with, even when we made them back in 1999. You know, we right. we'd always had a uh, our songwriting and recording approach was always somewhat stressed, and uh, the process was pretty intense, where we would just get together for a number of weeks and then just or a week or two weeks and just go straight into a studio and record whatever it was that we had and um for the first two or three releases it was a i i think collectively we felt like those records came off a bit more cohesively because our approach to writing the songs was such that sean or i would come in with a, a fairly clear idea uh like a, a, of a song structure or an arrangement with parts and stuff and uh, you know the the sean and, uh, and doug and fred would you know, make the song better with how, you know, what, how great they are as players. They just could just fix, you know, they could just figure it out really quickly. And we could easily get through, like we could easily have a record's worth of new songs ready to at least play through by the end of like four or five days of practice. And then we'd spend another three or four days working out the kinks. And then we'd go in and we'd record an album. But by the time we got to uh, our last studio record, we we all wanted to approach the music differently uh, with a more sort of like uh, 
open like like relationship with the songs where each of us sort of developed developed our parts in unison where we just didn't have song structures we stepped in with maybe a basic idea or a riff or a sample or a drum part and we just sort of try you know try to develop the song that way we were still working under the same pretense that we you know wanted to get it done in a matter of a week or two weeks and be in a studio and we'd set up studio time that we couldn't sort of let go of and by the time we we, we that whole the, the the songwriting process for our last record uh being so different we just weren't ready by the time we got to the studio because that process was it was the first time we tried to write oh, sure. um yeah, yeah, yeah. write like records write, write write music from the complete ground up as four people collaboratively and Very by the time we got way into of, of, of than how you've done it before yeah. yes and it just it it's the pro and it's a process that i you know i i, I fixate on because I, I feel like the songs musically and ownership wise are just so much better when they're written by the sum of their parts rather than just one person you know i feel like the music can be so much better if like everyone's creativity is sort of tapped into but it just takes a little bit longer you know and um we still like just wanted to kind of stick to the plan and we went into the studio and recorded the last record and i don't think any of us were ever really 100 percent sold on it but we you know we just did it and we came out and we just moved on and throughout the course of 1999 while we were out touring to support that record those songs like three or four of the songs that were on that album evolved so much that we you know we figured we learned how to play them a month and a half or two months after we recorded them you, you, you um, were better at playing them because they were more familiar and they were uh, like it, they were able to develop naturally in a, in a way that uh, led to better songs yeah yeah and we just all felt like i i again like doug and doug and fred are just so quick and such fast players that throughout the process of writing that record they were ready to go and i just i'm just not as i'm I'm not that great of a guitar player it takes me a long time i'm not intuitive it's all it, it, it's all process and just sort of like this heavy uh re repetition thing with me where i just need to kind of that kind of go away with the music for a while before i kind of get to anything that i actually feel like is worth it worth a nickel but anyway without it be, without making the story too long we when we got back together and 2018 sean thought like well why you know these songs don't even sound a couple of the songs are almost unrecognizable very different why, yeah yeah so why not why not just sort of like we we're not pinned into anything why don't we why don't we think about approaching a release where a small release where we're not even you know we're not really working on like absolutely new songs but these versions of these songs sound new enough to to us that we can make a record out of them and we just sort of made sort of a running list of what those tracks and what those songs were and then we we were approached by a guy in san jose actually who wanted to host a party for us where we'd go up into his uh up into this this up into the mountains outside of san jose and there's a friend of his who had a studio we were going to record there but that whole situation sort of fell apart about a week and a half before we were supposed to be on the west coast and we didn't know gotcha. where what, what was going to happen so that's when we sort of went into what that was the first step of what we of survivor mode which was sort of like calling other studios that were in the bay and asking if we, they might be able to host us and we could re record there and jonah was amenable and we showed up there and we recorded for three straight days and uh, got essentially the basic tracks for the record done, and then we ended up in Chicago to finish it up. Um, it was just a, 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 you know, ultimately like there's a lot of there's a lot of different with you know I don't want to get too boring or too detail oriented with the the making of the record, but there's like the the title sort of implies not just it not just the you know like the circumstance that I, that that I think we all sort of are relating to right now, which is sort of just like 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 pairing it back to just sort of like the bare essentials and the bare necessities and sort of what it is that we need just to sort of get through our day-to-day -day rituals but also through the process of making the record we just were you know like several things happened that just weren't awesome like the studio that we were going to record in and san jose falling apart then yeah yeah then Survivor was Survivor Sound was a terrific studio to work in, but it presented a few curfew problems that we were unaware of. You, you were used to, we're used to sort of going into a studio, and once it's 
you know, once you're in there, you can basically camp there for however long you want to be in there. And right. that, and that, and, but that's not ubiquitous. And at, at Survivor, Jonah was like, no, we kind of need to be done by a certain hour. Which is such and, a modern day Oakland thing that that didn't used to be the case. But now it's like, OK, it's OK. This is prime dot com real estate, guys. You know, like it's it's just so so much more of a thing. And he's had he's credit where credit's due. He's uh, done an amazing job uh, with what he has and has, you know. <laughs> tenacity of the cockroach like held it together and, and held it together. Uh, no no yeah. no he you know you know he was he, you know he was you know he was respectful i mean yeah. he wasn't like a he just was like he was very firm and it just sort of presented uh an unusual circumstance for us for the amount of work that we anticipated trying to get done within the shape of those right. three days and right. then and then before um before that chicago show that you had tickets for that you had a canvas during we were on. We were going to rehearse at Sean's studio in Chattanooga, and they, they, those guys came to pick me up at the airport. And on the way back to his Sean's house, um, he got a call from his wife saying that the studio had burned to the ground. Holy so, crap! Yeah, it was sucked. Like the, um, it was a studio that Sean. It was called. It was called Soul Stable, and it was a studio that Sean had pretty much built by hand, out of what was an old Civil War era horse stable that was on his on his family's property yeah. that he, he it was a crazy it's a crazy story he, yeah. yeah he was just out looking around in this uh, looking around it's like maybe uh, i think it's like 40 or 50 acres of property and it's one of the uh it's the largest piece of unbroken land in the city limits of chattanooga tennessee really wow. and he, yeah okay. so he's he's just out roaming and he discovers this building that nobody really had ever paid attention to it was under br- brush and trees and all kinds of stuff and he started uncovering and he really found this you know it was not at all like an all-season building by any stretch of the imagination it was an old horse stable and he he retrofitted he built up you know framed out rooms and put in windows and had like probably 50 or sixty thousand dollars worth of gear in it and uh you know we were just getting ready to get ready to go on tour we were going to play we rehearsed there for three days and then play in chattanooga or in knoxville and then start heading up toward chicago and yeah he got a call that uh it, it burned to the ground so that was that was another <sighs> te- another really messed up thing and then like we get done with the recording and the friggin' pandemic hits <laughs> <laughs> and you're like hey we're clear all right oh wait what yeah, yeah. <laughs> as far as but as far as like so there's just all these different all this sort of like weirdo stuff but um so the 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 Matmos involvement and the John McIntyre involvement was because we've always, you know, there's a, 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 there's not really a whole lot of reasons other than a truth be told, it's just for fun. Yeah, you, you know, know, we did. Why not? We had no interest. <laughs> why would you know? You? <laughs> and, and well, and yeah, well, and Mickey Mickey Darius Darius, who's in uh, who's also in San Francisco, who runs the label that put the record out. Um, you know, he does very curated. Uh, and specific releases for his labels that are like generally within a three to 500 range pressing, like not significant, like they're very intentionally kept small. And we were a project that sort of, he, you know, uh, initially I think we sort of thought like our project with Mickey was going to sort of be in that range as well. And just sort of grew exponentially into being something a little bit larger, but we, um, he, you know, we, we, you know, he, 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 when he approached us, he, you know, he was talking about how he liked the idea of uh, the records that he putting out, that that he was putting out, being sort of unusual for the musicians, not not very straight, not their normal sort of idea for a record. Like what? And, and at that point, we were already talking and making about talking about making a record that was not very normal for us. Right. So the whole concept fit neatly within our plan, and um, what it, just through the process, we realized and remembered that um, one of the songs that made it to the record is uh, uh, is a 1996 version of a song uh, that was re- released on a 1997 record that just it was, but it was a version that had not been released. Mm. Um, it was a 24. We found the. Was 20, that the, the the one that was in the fish tank one that you're talking about, or is it? A... No, no, it's the last song on the record. It's called okay. "Paint Your Face." It's oh sort yeah, of yeah, like, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we just we were like, well, let's. Because that one's on just, four great points, but it says "cut your face" instead. It's "cut your face," yeah. and the arrangement, everything about it is just a little bit 
different. The one on the new record is much more. It's not as smooth. It's a much more aggressive, and yeah. I, and I we, we heard it. Uh, we were just like, well, let's put that on there, and then uh, we just like, well, why not? We have this all split up into you know we'd had it we'd had it transferred from two inch analog tape to Pro Tools, so we just thought, why not just sort of like distribute these these tracks these wave files to matmos and see what they can do you know because they're friends of ours they're friends of mine from louisville drew and i used to play he he was a guest on one of the best projects that i've ever done oh really back in the yes it's the best music that i've ever made it was a rap band called king g and j crew interesting I'm, okay it, it's no it's not really the best thing i've ever done okay. <laughs> no 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 but it, was, it really isn't but i like to say that i like to say that it is and I'll, I'll send you some links but back in the early early 90s we we drew and i had worked on drew who's also part of matmos drew and martin are matmos i should say but he and i worked had worked on a few projects sort of just collaboratively back in the day and i'm always I'm always looking for excuses and reasons to sort of reach out to people to see if they're interested to sort of do stuff with things that we've made just to sort of see what their bend is on it. And he was amenable and they, they came up with their thing and John was, you know, in the throes of the pandemic and we were all in the middle of all these cancellations and we're just like, well, why don't you see what John can make too? Right. Right. Um, So really it's just sort of a, it's just sort of like um, outreach and just sort of like fun to sort of in, in, involve your friends and in your project and sort of just sort of expand on the idea of what like our uh, like a weirdo band record could be. Well, and it's interesting because in, at least in the Bay Area, there was a significant crossover between bands such as yourself and uh, that particular style of, of electronic artists and even that most specifically. I mean, I remember hearing like a couple DJ sets where. I want. I want to say I actually have heard a Juno Forty Four and Matmos song like right next to each other, like within the DJ set, like mixed together. Oh, is that right? Yeah, because that's very. It's such a specifically kind of early two thousands Bay Area uh, trend or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, but it. I mean, hey, I I like all that stuff. So that's cool by me. But it was funny that when I saw that, I was like, oh. That's interesting. That's interesting that that would be uh, something that they were doing. And I, I kind of presumed it was like, a, well, why the hell not? Why wouldn't we kind of situation? Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that it would be, that you have that relationship, especially with Matmos, because, I mean, they're, you know, Matmos is, is very beloved in San Francisco, especially. So it was like an interesting, uh, an interesting pairing. And it was, it, it's, it's something that does seem to work and it does have, uh, like it fits the vibe. Like, like the the feeling of the whole thing is is sort of like we're doing this because we just feel like doing it. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like there's this whole like reunion concept and records that bands make when they come back, and I, you know, like there's some people that probably would have preferred if we just recorded the chorus to "Cut Your Face" or to <laughs> "Sharks and Sailors" for both album sides. Yeah, just, just play that. Just do a super cut of that. <laughs> Just play that for 18 minutes. Even more sharks and even more sailors is what you. Yeah, exactly. Just just do that, and then then we're happy, and then it's the best record that you've ever made. You know, and I just felt like I I think we collectively just sort of felt like that's not what we're going to do, and we never really like set out to make records to sort of, you know, we we, we, honestly we're just playing the music. You know, we're just doing what feels feels best and feels the most honest, and yeah that that sort of what arrives on our records and for better or worse you know but we just can't like we're not gonna like I did it and also like that record like coming back after 18 20 years of having not released any new music we're gonna get like people are either gonna like it or there's some people that are hated it before it even came out for all the uh, for, for whatever reason there's just so we just we're just like what doesn't it for us it was just sort of just enjoy the process and and put out something that we are proud of, you know, and just let that let it let a rip like that versus putting a whole lot of putting a, investing a whole lot of stock or mental headspace into making what may be like like a record that maybe comes off as being disingenuous. Because truth be told, like we don't have like we're different people. We're like I'm like, I'm like friggin' almost fifty. I don't like I can't do what I used. To. I can't. I, I don't even play that. In, in many ways, like the, the you know, we, we we continuously talk about like what the next record is, like what 
the record is at this point now that we've gotten this thing out of our system which is almost like a union between then and now it's sort of we you know i i have uh, it's just a really curious concept just to consider what the next thing is for us or any of us musically because I, i i i don't even know how we would really collectively complete some of the songs that i've been working on and simultaneously uh that holds true for how though I would be able to work and integrate myself into the songs that those guys are working on. But that's what sort of compels us as well. Like that challenge. Right. Solving that so piece. yeah. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it, it's also complicated because we can't really be in the same room right now. And a lot of people are doing this technology thing where they zoom into practice and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I gotta just, I gotta get better at Zoom, honestly, because I, you know, it's killing me. I, I want to, I want to be able to work on a, a multitude of different things, and I think for the next like six months or so, that's really going to be the only safe way to do it. Uh, first of all, I just like to point out that I'm not sure if it's what you said or not, but I'm gonna hope that you did disingenuous, which is an incredible malapropism for disingenuous. Uh, that, 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 that was great, greatly amusing to me. Disingenuous. I like, I like that quite a bit. Uh, secondly, huh. also it, it's interesting that to me, like within the record, like, a, like, like a song, like have a safe trip deer kind of seems like that will, that would be like a special, uh, Juno 44 special order. Right. But then there's also stuff where the whole thing kind of, kind of being a, a, like a smorgasbord of different things works because it wasn't like. There wasn't this anticipation like, oh, there's a new Juno 44 record. It was like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> and it oh, like just what it was there. Extra. Yeah, and it's like, oh, and then there's just this thing. It's like, well, okay, that's a, that's a that's an actual pleasant surprise for once, rather than you know the other way around. Uh, you know, in the same way that that Hum record kind of came out of nowhere for people that are fans. Oh, yeah, I, like, I see oh, what you mean. Oh, okay, yeah. it's right on. You know, and and that's yeah. th- to me that's interesting because it's just almost completely impossible to surprise people with anything nowadays. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I found that impressive just in its own right. And then the least of which is like, oh, this is kind of eclectic. You know, there's that, uh, the re-recording of what was a cardiac atlas. Um, You know, it's something where it's just like, okay, some of these are, it's it's like almost seem like reimaginings, but then it makes sense too. When you talk about the Anahata stuff and like having like, not feeling like it's necessarily, fully baked or you know fully uh fully gestated and the versions that are on the record that's like oh well this makes sense if you if you, if you stop and think about it because the, the songs had time to kind of take on their own life and then you know songs don't stop living too <laughs> yeah well well our friend you know our friend jay i'm sure have you you know who jay ryan is oh, yeah of course yeah yeah yeah, well, you know, he, no, I, no. I, no, I read, I read <laughs> somewhere he said, um, he said something that resonated with me, which was just like, I wish that I, I don't, I'm, whatever song it was, but it was like, I wish they'd played, I, I wish they'd recorded that after playing it for two or three months. Yeah. And that just sort of was a ping that, uh, I, you know, I had to pay attention to because it's true. Like nowadays, like we, you know, my other bands like shipping news was very particular in the studio you know like we were very cognizant of like just taking our very very glacially paced and just sort of making sure that we you know we we crossed all the t's and dotted all the i's and just tried to get everything as concise as we possibly could and and you know as far as like the surprise of the new is the this june 44 record there's a few things like when we were, you know, like it, it, it's an unusual circumstance for us because we, you know, back when we were still making records, Touch and Go is hyper healthy. Uh, you know, yeah. the end of the 90s was yeah. still, they were like the streaming hadn't really fucked everything up. And Corey was still like, there, there was just so much prosperity, as, like as far as and possibility and just sort of like, you know, an in, in intuitive direction was just sort of just like just to keep going. It's a different you know, world, and you know, pretty yeah, much than how it is. Yeah, so, yeah, so you know, when we, you know, when we sort of saddled ourselves back together, and it was um, time to figure out who was going to put out our our records, and all, if somebody was going to do it, you know, at that point when we were, you know, getting ready to go into San Jose to record something, and we had all of that plan put together to record whatever it was that we had ready, 
we didn't even know what it was going to be. We were just going, oh, this guy's going to offer a free session, and we're going to go record there, and maybe we'll have a record. And yeah, and there's it was like just sort some of, totality of the thought behind it, right? <laughs> yeah, and like, and then, and then with with Mickey and with Broken Clover, like his whole business model is there's a bit of arrhythmia there for us, just because we have, you know, he he has a very clear and direct idea of what he wants his record label to be. And, you know, I wouldn't say that we, we've never really, I wouldn't say we've been 100% at odds or like angry with each other, but we just disagree. <laughs> if that, if that makes any sense on yeah, how, sure. um, like we want certain things to be done and we, but we can't, we know there's, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a mutual respect for each other and we just are careful to, you know, just as far as our gratitude and our appreciation for what each, each party offers. But at the end of the day, like, his label is sort of resistant to certain industry norms that we were sort of more, more sort of like reared on with, with touch and go, you know, things like, like publicity for that matter, or, uh, you know, like, like there's, you know, he wasn't, he, he just doesn't, doesn't really have the resources or the infrastructure to really publicize right. or promote a record. And, um, that's curious you know that was curious for us but it, you know we're just it, again like it was this weirdo strange record we were initially only planning on making three or four hundred copies of it or whatever and it didn't seem like uh it didn't seem like that big of a stretch just to sort of let that flow but yeah you know the it, it, in many ways like you know it's a surprise as much of a surprise as maybe it came off it's like oh this is happening it's like for us, it was like, wow, this is happening like this. Wow, this is, you know, you know. And, totally. And, and no, a no, good, I get it. In a good, in a good, and in a very bad way. I mean, no disrespect at all towards like the record label or how things are sort of moving. But we just, I haven't put out a record since 2011. And it's been, as I gonna say, it's been a while. Well, it's been a long time since Juno 44, but it's been a long time since you did, there's been a record that you put out in general. Uh, yeah. Well, there. Well, now, like, there is like, you know, there's a few things that happened, but they weren't like. You know, they were sort of posthumous records. Yeah. There was a couple. There was a. Uh, the there were two. Uh... Well, there were no. There was two two Rodan things that happened. Oh, there was, yeah. Yeah, there were oh, two yeah, Rodan that things that happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, come on now. I'm blushing. I'm turning. I'm turning pink. Um, no, but like those things were like they My were. My memory's a sieve in... these days. Sorry, man. <laughs> 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 but you know they were like on they were quarter stick releases and they were just yeah. sort of like and they're very important and special uh as far as like what their what their latitude range was for us and just sort of how deep they sort of went as far as the content and you know all the different things that we've sort of discussed with jason and just sort of like having those things sort of have 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 presence was was sort of crucial and important and touch and go right supports that and they wanted them to to exist but as far as like the process is concerned it was it was very very similar like uh, you know there was a production person at, at, at touch and go and quarter stick who you'd call and they would you know walk you through the process or there was a you know like the graphic designer and yeah, all the it, different it, things there was a whole uh, team of people and it was, a, it was an operation so to speak yeah you know? <laughs> yeah i'll be it much more paired back and not as not as you know unified but they're you know the, all of the parts were still there to put out those the, the sorts of records that you know in a similar way uh that they were put out back in the you know late 90s uh mid 90s but they're all they're they're all there but you know it was just uh not it, the, the process of making the, the the newer record was just the, the record that we put out in broken clover was just a pretty unique experience and it was telling i was like wow we've you know, as thankful as I have ever been for being in the process of working on music with record labels, it's just I, I, I just really feel fortunate to have had people that have been interested and want to want to work with us, honestly. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's always nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nice yeah. thing just to have that, uh, especially when you get in your head about something, to have that vote of confidence that someone's willing to put, you know, put it on the line for you. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a nice feeling. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, you you, we I I can't remember if we talked about this last time or not because uh, the aforementioned memory of being a sieve. But uh, that that fifteen quiet years, how did you end up picking the stuff that was on there? Because there was a bunch of like live recordings and things like that. I mean, I'm sure there was like a lot of ephemera uh, and thing. But I thought it was, I thought it was very well done. 
Uh, oh, thank you. Especially as someone that, you know, it, it was just a little bit before my time, so I, I missed it like completely. So it was something where it's like, oh, that's awesome. They put together this thing. Like you can kind of like get like a a hint of like other elements of things that you know could have been or were and you know weren't documented in a certain way. So how did you end up? How did you end up picking well, what you picked for that? Like how how did well that the core of it was like the well the the you know the the core of it was the peel session that we yeah. recorded in 1993 or 1994 uh, while we were in Britain. The core of it was that, and you know there was a guy from Canada or something that had been bootlegging and putting it out on CD. It wasn't that, you know, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of like newness to the material. Anybody that knew the band back then had already probably heard a lot of the, the a lot of the a things that were on that record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like or some like VHS like transfer like on a you know like on a banana. But the um <laughs> the <laughs> but like but like we you know we you know we, that process was unusual as well because we tried to fish back the 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 master reels from from the peel session from the bbc and initially like we'd always wanted to get a give those songs a different treatment like a remastering the way the guy mixed while we were making those songs was just insane and mixed everything really loud and we just weren't 100 percent happy with it so the whole concept of the record from you know we got back in 94 and by 95 or 96 the year or two after the band had broken up Jason and I were trying to trying to fish back the tape so that we could put out a different version of it. But the licensing fees to the BBC were just astronomical. It's like they were initially they were like, "Yeah, we'll send you, we'll send it, we'll send this stuff to you. It'll be twenty thousand bucks." And we're like, "We can't, we can't afford twenty for that thing. That's it." Jesus, yeah. I mean, I was like, "That's no, that's so we." But eventually, as sort of time went on and you know interest went away or trickled out or whatever and like not necessarily the band or you know prestige or anything but just in terms of just like like how things were being done as far as making money with licensing deals and records and those sorts of things in general the bbc eventually after literally after maybe 12 or 13 years said like yeah we'll you know we'll we'll, we'll part with it now for a, a fee that is Reasonable. very much in line with your budget and we we're like oh cool we're finally going to get the tapes we're finally going to get the tapes let's do this and Corey was totally stoked and we paid the fee and they were like uh you know we can just email you the document <laughs> like what and they're like yeah it's just a digital file ah! it said we have you know we transferred out it's just a dat tape ah. we're like what the no so there was no there's oh. nothing like the CD version that douchebag from Canada had been cycling to wherever that version was essentially what we got from the BBC, but we were able to, you know, have Bob remaster it and yeah. give it some sort of a treatment to sort of broaden it and open it up a bit. Oh, what a letdown. And, and, Jeez. After all that time too. Ugh. Well, we should have known. I mean, like the, the way that all those sessions sort of work is unless they're important, like, you know, like, like Lenny Kravitz or the Rolling Stones or something like that. They they just re record over everything. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well I mean they, they you know, look look, BBC, right? They they all those cl- yeah. a bunch of classic Doctor Who episodes are like, ah, eh, just tape over. It's just some stupid kid show, you know. Like it's it's Yeah, they, exactly. Uh, they're, they're like our shit was it. yeah, they didn't it didn't matter to it didn't hold any hold sway. But then the other um the other things were uh you know, there, there were there were like eight track versions of some of our songs that that were on rusty it was that we had recorded and sort of were circulating through cassette tapes that we just wanted to have a vinyl home for yeah. and we were just looking for ways to fill out the record with live material and just things that jason and i thought were of interest and uh and and, and pertinent and had some value in terms of the story of the band so we just sort of figured curated it in a way that made made some sense to us i mean interest in the band rodan is you know at a medium level but truck stop truck stop is where the oh is. that's the one right there that's the right <laughs> you're picking it up <laughs> honestly like i mean i don't i don't want to get away uh, truck stop in just a moment no but, no we, we know, talked we, about that last time we don't need to talk okay. about truck stop that's but the, that's the thing about thing. the thing that you know the thing about um the 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 15 quiet years record that is 
uh, you know, the, probably more valuable than holding the record in my hands is sort of the process of making it. Because Jason, yeah. J- I just moved to the Northeast, uh, moved to the Northeast in 2010 on the heels of finding out that he was sick. And we finished the the last shipping news record, which was a live recording, which, you know, was recorded a month before he was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. But we, like the majority of the time I was at work for those two or three years at my print shop before he passed away, like we would just sit on the phone together and just talk about production stuff. He would call me and he may have been on like whatever opioids it was that were trying to keep him from like killing himself in pain from chemotherapy and the cancer that was in him. We would just sit there on the phone and talk about paper colors or weights. So we'd just talk about this and like be looking at screens and be like, ooh, that color is just so nice. And it was just so, just such a beautiful, bright, shining moment for for me because I knew that he was using, as a tool, like those projects were, he utilized those records as sort of ways that, you know, I think in some way or in parallel and tandem to what I was just talking about with ways that we're sort of getting through the pandemic and all of this and civil stuff is that we just sort of need to focus, uh, redirect our energies and focus on uh, art and music and, 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 and things that are crucial and important to ourselves. So that record, like, in you know, that Rodan record definitely occupies that headspace for me. And, you know, it's like, it, it's like that, that's the legacy that's within that record is that, you know, year and a half of trying to have, of trying to have it be realized and working with him through it. I mean, on one hand, it's, you know, it's, it's a, com- <laughs> it's beyond a bummer uh, because of the situation, but it, it's, it's really cool that, he got to take such an active role in, in helping, you know, give it, give it its due diligence, uh, and yeah. uh, due release, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's a worthy thing. And, you know, as oh, much man, as thanks. You know, it's a, it's a, it's another weird one though, you know, like yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, it's like, it's like another weird one. Like that was weird. And then, you know, we did the, uh, did, did our hat fa- the hat factory record came out last year which was after you and i talked so there was another oh yeah that's right yeah, yeah there's a record that was um that was you know interestingly as we we were getting ready to record uh the same songs there's essentially all the material that ended up on rusty on our actual only proper lp uh we were getting i was loading up the gear into um Tara station wagon to drive it to Baltimore to record at, at, a, at the Hat Factory recording studio at this yeah. old studio there. And um, that, that was like uh, what, like ninety three, like somewhere. Yeah, like, like, more or less. Or, yeah, yeah, it was early ninety three. It was actually it was Hound Sound. It was it wasn't Hat Factory. We called it Hat Factory, which is unusual because those recordings were done at a studio called Hound Sound. But um, with 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 Tony, uh, of Tony French or Forrest French, but he um. He he'd recorded the aviary uh, the aviary EP, which was the cassette thing that we oh, made sure. before yeah, Rusty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, we wanted to record with him again. So, but his old studio, which was the Hat Factory, was was no longer existent, and he wanted to record us at this other place that he was going to call Hat Factory. But at any rate, we got there, we recorded it, and we weren't really. Uh, no, sorry, I, I jumped the gun. We were getting into Tara's car. This is after Corey Rusk had seen Rodan play. Um, uh, for Derby, Derby is first. It was the first Saturday in May, and Corey came down to Louisville. Corey Russ from Touch and Go yeah, yeah. came down to Louisville, and um, I didn't think you were talking about we, Corey Hart. Don't worry. No, or you know, there's lots of Corys in my life. But anyway, like <laughs> we were opening, we were opening for we were we played before uh, Palace Brothers before the very first oh, Palace okay. Brothers show. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Corey showed up and saw us play, and we'd never met or anything like that. We didn't really talk to him or anything like that. And I was just, oh, Corey was here. That's cool. We didn't think much of it. And then two weeks later, we were getting ready to drive to Baltimore to record all this music with Tony French. Uh, and as we were loading our gear out, like I heard the phone ring from inside the house, and I walked in, and it was Corey saying that he wanted to put out uh, a Rodan record. And I was like, oh, shit, we're getting ready to drive to Baltimore to do this thing. And at that point, like, everything changed as far as, like, the trajectory and the potential for the record and 
we got to Baltimore and I think we were all just a little bit like, wow, you know, like, you, you know, maybe we should be it, it, at that, you know, we're just kids. We're like 21, 22 year old kids. And we're like, what the hell is this? This is crazy. For me, it was like, it was epic because I, you know, I remember walking around in malls and Louisville where there were actual record stores when they were still in malls and finding no. touch and go records, touch and yeah, go absolutely. releases, yeah. finding the, finding the headache EP. Yeah. I remember it was like, it was yesterday, like at, at Oxmoor mall in Louisville and finding the headache, headache EP in a record bin and not knowing anything about it. It looks amazing. It was like, <laughs> yeah. like pus head artwork, a head exploding. Yeah. I was yeah, like, yeah. what is it? And I brought it home and, put it on and I listened to it for like four or five months. I was like, this is just an amazing record. And then I finally realized that it was supposed to be played at 33 and a third, <laughs> uh, 45, 45 RPMs. It was a 30, I was playing it at 32. It was like that much slower. But anyway, but anyway, it, was it a all sounded like the Melvins, I'm sure. I mean, that's, that's uh Steve is the one who first, I forget how he phrased it, but that like the test of a really good song is if you still like it. I played at the wrong speed. If it's 33, it might be 45, or vice versa. It's a yeah, that's song. that's it's precisely right. Like it was a set, it was a it was a 12 inch single, so it was supposed to be played at 45 RPMs, and I've been listening to it for half a year at 33 <laughs> and third. And I, so, but so when I figured it, finally figured it out that I was supposed to play it faster. I was like, wow, it's like two records in one. Anyway, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. The, but um, <laughs> but that's like, how Godflesh was born. Yeah, but that was just sort of a gateway to all of the all of that stuff, you know, all of the early touch and go releases, and to to have Corey have called and to have him on the phone and just be talking to him, he's you know just be talking to him before we're getting ready. Anyway, like changed the whole like mood of the session, and we just by the time we got to Baltimore to record, we just weren't one hundred percent. Um our heads were just not really where they needed to be. And at the point in the studio wasn't perfect. It was a, you know, it just felt uh, all of it felt sort of off and we didn't really think anything of it. We didn't really, we just sort of like, well, we'll just do that. And that, that happened. And now we can go to Chicago and record, at Steve Albini's studio with Bob Weston. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and so we did. So and that, and that and that's diminutive in a way. I don't mean to be, but it was sort of like this situation where we just sort of just shelved this recording that we made, and it just sort of disappeared for a number of uh, literally like almost 15 years. And then um, Adam Adam Reach, who used to work at Touch and Go, somehow came across. Uh, the half inch reels for it. I don't know how he found them, but he. I, uh, do you know? Who, do you know who Adam is? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, was it um, pu- uh, Poison pure, Arrows? Poison Arrows. I almost said Pure Arrows, which is the Dead Moon. <laughs> yeah, and he's but, you know, he's such yeah. a sweet dude. He found it. And I think he maybe found it through Henry Owings. Anyway, like it sort of trickled back into our hands. Well, and, and it's interesting uh, because it's like the yeah, like the everyday world of bodies on there. It's kind of like choppier and noisier. There's like uh, there's this different di- this different faces of, of like the same kind of song. Like you, it's like this. It, it's the feel is still there, but it has a completely different feel. Like I mean, there's uh, the one song where uh, Tara's like way kind of forward in the mix. Instead oh. of uh, in the version on Rusty, uh, Jungle Gym. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it's just really yeah. cool to hear like kind of like the A B of it. I'm like, oh wow, that's like no, I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, and she she made it happen. She was at Kevin Raderman's studio in California, and they were working on a completely or in Louisville actually working on something completely different. And she he gave her or she gave him his hard drive, her hard drive, and he opened it up, and they were getting ready to open up the session that she wanted to work on, and he said, "What's this Rodan folder?" And she was like, oh, that's this transferred session from, you know, from 1992, 1993. We don't really care for him. She's like, oh, I want to listen to it. I'm just going to. And she's like, oh, well, copy it over. You can do whatever you want with it. So <laughs> he he essentially just beefed it up. He basically used every filter and every effects processor he had in the studio to make it sound palpable. And then we, we it just became that record. So anyway, it was just kind of nuts. Well, and it's... it's... It's interesting because I mean, you guys were, you know, and this this is a while back. Like you're, you're we're still all pretty young, and you know that that's like <laughs> kind of a wild time to be uh, to be around. That was sort of like you know indie rock gold rush stuff was happening. <laughs> and yeah. To, to the world at large, uh, you know, I can't. I, I again, I I always am 
try to try to be careful about repeating stuff. But I don't remember if we talked that much about it. Like, I mean, did you feel like you had like common cause with a uh, with a lot of like the touch and go bands and and uh, things like that? Like, where where did you feel like Rodan fit in back then? I, in many ways, on most of my things that I worked on. And I, I just, like I like I feel like a lot of the projects that I've and this isn't like a bad thing per se, but I feel like a lot of the things that I've made, uh, I feel like like and it's not a suffrage thing, but I feel like they're often criticized by comparisons or by sort of like mm. their relationships to other pro other things that are related to me, but I have no like creative input within the shapes of those things. Gotcha. So I sort of feel like 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 like. Not that we sort of like operate in the shadows of uh, of other other people's work or other people's projects, but in some ways, like that, like we are what we eat, and I feel like I definitely like like there's some like I like I I honestly I just couldn't really hold it together in many ways when we first walked into Steve's house and in in chicago i was like what am i how did how did i end up here well, like that's like time. <laughs> yeah that's like that's not that's that's like sun studios for me that's right, like being right. in you know that's yeah. like being a you know on a, a flickinger the parliament funkadelic soundboard or something yeah, like that yeah. what how that's what that is to me is like being at, at at steve's console and having bob record our record and then meeting them and you know i, I like to think that we're 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 definitely you know, we, we, we're, we're friends, but you know, I, you know, there's a level of respect for them that I have that they're just, they're, they're, they're deep guys. And I just, I don't want to, and you know, I, have, I don't have any expectations of our, our relationships. I mean, I, I love them en enormously. And there's a, there, you know, there's, there's, there's bands that are like Shannon, Shannon Wright. I, you know, she's, she's one of those people that I just always sort of come back to and I consider her a pretty close friend of mine. And, bands that are immediately related to our projects of course like rachel's and yeah. uh you know those sorts of things and and man or Astroman, but like some of the some of the older the bands that were part of touch and go before we were part of touch and go they um i just i just you know i i, I freak out when i'm around them <laughs> i kind of just lose a short circuit i don't know how to talk anymore well but it's also you know i'm always surprised when i find you know, musicians and, and like lifer uh, music folks that aren't huge fans of certain things, right? That, that you don't have the, those bands. It's like, oh my god, oh my god, I can't believe this is happening. You know, like it's and and I I'm lucky enough that you know I get to talk to people like that all the time on this show, and it blows my mind. If I ever stop to think about it, it blows my mind. <laughs> sure, sure. And I, and I usually sure. don't. <laughs> but then every once in a while, I'll be like, "Wow, I did." You know, I I had a dude from Devo in here. I had a dude from the Stooges on. Oh my god! And but yeah, I'm right. a huge fan of like every. Well, that's that's the thing. I never have anyone. I'm not a huge fan of their work. That's the key to the show. But it's <laughs> <laughs> your own special secret. You know, I mean, keep people, it to yourself. Yeah, it's it's like it, it isn't like a one size fits all thing. Let's put it that way. I would. I, would, I just a bunch of people I wouldn't uh, have on. But but I, I you know I get it. But it's also. You know, and you know, first with Rodan, but also with June of forty four. It's like these these folks also became your contemporaries as well. And and uh, you know, you're you were doing the work. Like, did you find that that elevation, that mental elevation, changed at all at, at any point, or were you still kind of always like, or did you, or did you just, you know, are you hanging out and then suddenly you have the epiphany of like, wow, I can't believe that uh, you know that's the person that made that record or something along those lines. Like, what, what, how does that? How does that operate? Uh, and the reason why well, I ask I think, is, I think, is because I think for me, what, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say the reason why I ask because I think there's a lot of people that will put you in that echelon yourself. So I well, think that's, un, I, that, that's an unusual. Th oh, I think in many ways, like I, like I, you know, like um, the one size fits all thing that you said just a moment ago. Like I, for the longest time, I sort of felt like, I, you know, like I kind of fit neatly within and could easily calibrate myself with a lot of people that were sort of doing things that were that were similar to me like aesthetically or like choice wise as far as lifestyle and those sorts of things are concerned but anymore like uh like i i you know as we age and as we sort of continue to make you know decisions and choices 
responsible choices, not only to, you know, the environment or to our families, but also, we, you know, where we balance those choices to make sure that we're making the right decisions for ourselves so that we can keep ourselves healthy for all of the different things that we sort of are in it, integrated with. I sort of, I, you know, I stopped sort of feeling uh, so, or not necessarily not, I, I didn't necessarily stop feeling like I wasn't part of that culture, part of that uh, you know, it wasn't, it was less that it was less that I didn't feel involved or integrated. It was more that I just was unaware of it. Mm -hmm. I sort of was able to separate myself from that sort of like consistent feeling of sort of being dialed in and fixated on who, like who, who was doing what, or like how I like what what's relationable to me as far as what I'm doing versus what someone else is doing. And once that sort of went away, uh, like, I, like I can pretty much like like I, I'm not as insecure, I guess, as far as like how it, how I relate to people that I once were was just like would not have felt very comfortable being in the same room with. I wouldn't say that's true for like Nick Cave. Like if I was in a room with Nick Cave, <laughs> I might lose I might I might lose or like like Lucinda Williams or someone right. like that. I sure. might just kind of yeah. come on hands, but like. I like I I'm, I'm I can be a comfortable conversationalist now better than maybe I may have been like you know 15 or 20 years ago with the same person. Makes Does sense. that stack up? Does that sort of answer? No, absolutely. That, sort of no, that, that absolutely yeah. makes sense. And and it's and the only reason I bring it up is because uh, you know I think it's something a lot of listeners of the show and the listening audience has grown, but also sort of changed a little bit too. And I feel like it used to be mostly like. <laughs> it used to be all musicians and people that knew me personally, and now, yeah. and now it's like yeah, kind yeah. of grown. And, and you know, some people do have that kind of thing where, you know, they meet a musician that they like or an artist they like, and, and they just don't even know like how to start a conversation or how to, bro <laughs> you yeah. know, because like, well, they look at them on a pedestal. Well, uh, yeah, it's it, it's curious because I feel like I, you know, like I was having a hard time just sort of figuring it out like for a long time about what. You know, when people like when you said a moment ago that people sort of looked up to me or to Sean or Fred or Doug or to Tara or people like us that have been doing these mm -hmm. things for so long. Um, like I think that the, at, at our core, and this is like the 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 the, the most important part of uh, our creativity is that we just aren't bullshit. We're not right. bullshitting. We're not trying to bullshit you. We're not trying to sell ourselves on you. Yeah. We're not trying to convince you um, of any of anything like, you know, um, in fact, like we're like, uh, like we're the opposite of bullshit. If that, if I can, uh, if I can say that. <laughs> That's so, good. That's good. so like, like I feel like that. And I think in that once I realize, like, you know, like I'm just doing, like, I'm just trying to source like something genuine and something legitimate that is like like an extension of a thought or an idea or uh, some sonic headspace that, that isn't bullshit like once i just sort of came to that like that that sense then it it, it sort of like leveled me in a way that made me just gave me a little bit more confidence because prior to that i just was having a hard time i guess weaving in and out of just like is this good? Is this bad? And I was like, well, it's not really about that. It's more about if it's, le if it, if it's, if it's for real or if it's bullshit. And I feel like that I think might be what sort of makes me feel a little bit more like an enigma or some sort of an anomaly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know, maybe I don't as, know. A, as a metric, that's a pretty good one. I would say, I mean, <laughs> you could, you could uh, do a lot worse. <laughs> yeah, I guess, so. I guess, so. I mean, you know, I mean, and that, that's just my perception and what I'm shooting for anybody who sort of, and then, you know, and then there's the whole other side of that. Like you might put out, uh, I might make a piece of artwork or tell a story or make a song or whatever it is. And someone's perception of it might be completely different than that. They might think I'm totally full of shit. That's just fine. That's totally okay. <laughs> Well, and, and I do actually do. I, I want to talk a little bit about Dexterity Press because I feel like it was the one thing I kind of left on the table last time. But, uh, but before that, I do kind of want to talk about, you know, we had to be given a lot of time for Rodan this time. But but the switch up when June of 44 started, I mean, there's the nice thing about that band, first of all, is that there's um, different elements to it, like almost like experimental jazz and like dub parts, as well as like the post punk and kind of angular guitars and things along those lines. And it's something where it, it made a 
distinctive voice that was more than the sum of its parts. And yeah. also, like, happened at a time where, you know, it's still you could get that cultural cachet of, of people. The, the, like, you had a mysterious image. You know, there's that, that kind of, like, big nautical energy <laughs> going yeah. on. But, like, it wasn't like, you know, it was like, hey, the band looks like this. Here's what we four dudes look like, you know. It, it was it was a little bit kind of like finding a book that you just thought the cover was really cool. And, yeah. Like, and, bre- and breaking into it. And... Uh, just immediately there there was a certain degree of depth to it that was like oh this is cool they're exploring that the, the you guys the kind of guys kind of work through and then it, it really impressed me that you managed to do a similarish thing with shipping news while also being completely different and <laughs> Was was any of that like you know like hey let's let's try to do this or was it more just like hey we got these people in the room and it this is what it sounds like, uh, you know how much of that was preconceived? Uh, the, uh, I, I don't think it was really uh, for as far as Juno Forty Four is concerned there wasn't really any permutations or pre- preconceptions at all there wasn't really an intended um, like mystique or aberrationness or any of those sorts of things like I think. Um, Interestingly, like there was a period of time when a lot of people thought that, uh, like, like I would get this in interviews frequently, like what, like, uh, and, and it happens to this day, even still, like people offer me drugs. <laughs> they think they think I'm. They thought like we were just drug addled, like yeah. junked out, junked out people, and I've never. I'm. Uh, I mean. 100% straight. I've never smoked pot in my life. I've never touched the stuff. I've had examples in in my youth of people that were. Yeah. complete bingers and bent like go on these you know and like sm- smoked so much marijuana it just made me not want to touch the stuff but i never and and that's fine if you do i'm not i'm not it's no discredit and disservice to anyone who wants to smoke pot it's just something that it was just an interesting interpretation of me because the, the music the, sounds a certain way assuming that it has certain substances that like i'm just like some yeah. that i'm junked up or like you know like all these things so it's just always interesting like when people would approach us after shows and they would give me like a joint they'd be like hey jeff do you want a joint and i'd be like oh sure i'll take it and i would go and i'd give it to sean or to fred <laughs> or to Doug or something like that and well, after let me go and pay this forward point, yeah and they would they, but no one would ever approach them no one would ever walk up to That's they were the funny. only they were the guys that smoked pot anyway like it was just interesting because it got to a point to where they were um after the shows they would look at me and ask me if i they would be like jeff did you get any pot, did you get any pot? <laughs> um were you just the so approachable was, one like what what why yeah, no one that, i think people out. just thought that i was I think people just thought that i had it like, up. that i was into it yeah exactly but no uh, none of the none of the uh none of that was and none of it was sort of like a gag or um intentional there's no intentionality in terms of trying to d- develop anything i think if in, in, as far as like a mystique or being sort of elusive i think for me like i coming out of the heels of rodan like i was just really trying to make uh like something that was complete you know make a full thing like that had like a that that had some gravity to it rather than just uh you know, just putting out just another record. Like it needed to have like this sort of, um, it needed to get, have some sense of concept. Um, and I think the, you know, the first record being what it was, I think it just sort of, we just elongated that through through the next one or two, like that sort of theme with uh, the, the, you know, I, we have talked about this in interviews into the ground, but just like the idea that like we were living in separate places and, the importance of travel and using music as, as a means to sort of get to various places that I might not otherwise have been able to go to and just sort of integrating all of that sort of concept into the aesthetics of the record as well. I mean, and did you, were you surprised by what people kind of latched on to? Like, I mean, from in my circles anyway, like, uh, you know, we made a joke about it earlier, but you know, sharks, sharks and sailors is one of those songs that, like it justifies its length, but also, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that like people can easily yell in, in any, in any setting, you know, maybe at a polite dinner or something. And it's, it's going to oh, be yeah, awesome it's a, and it's hilarious. A, it's a, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it just really is. It really is. And that's like, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I didn't, I don't think we, we, no, we never really had any expectations. I think, I think really we were just sort of, um, 
happy to be working and happy happy to be able to travel and happy to be able to make uh, records with Touch and Go. And then uh, sure, but were you like really that nine minute song? You know, however long it is, I don't even remember how long it is. Oh, that particular song? <laughs> yeah, well, the yeah. song like it, like that? No, yeah, no, right? Like, yeah, I was like, that's this the one. Is like, huh? Okay, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. But you know, as far as like perception is concerned, that was sort of like there were like three or four of them, but there, that was the one that was like. Yeah. Uh, and when we get back together and we work on that song, we, we you know, it's sort of, oh, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm just not, not speaking for myself specifically, but speaking for other people in the group, like it's not, it's not a band favorite to play. So that's always really? an interesting thing. Oh, okay. Huh. And not a collective band favorite to play. It's a fun song to play, but there's other, there's other yeah, ones that we more... look more forward to kind of getting into. And I just always yeah. am like, I'm just. I, I I like it, and I like yeah. that uh, you know I like that it means something to the people that come to see us play. It, it means something to them to be able to hear us play that particular song. I mean, it's a in tough many tune. Way, it, like it, make, you know, it makes it, sense that people would latch on to me, but you know, I'm not also not in the band. You know, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah well, it's a jam too. You know, okay, why is why is that yeah. the one that people like? Fuck yeah, best song ever. I don't know. It's <laughs> I don't get it. Well, the thing I, I just think like there's you know like we, we when we play live like it's just really important to sort of you know like the music sort of comes out of us but the the people in the room sort of make the show yeah. and if the people in the room aren't really feeling part of it then the music just sort of just disappears it becomes nothing so like, there's like just a whole Greg sage would just like play a bunch of songs that nobody's <laughs> ever heard before when the wipers would play yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, I thought we were gonna yeah, hear yeah. of America. Come on, man. Bass solo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bass solo. Uh, but the uh, but um, but you know, like I think I think for us, uh, I think for June of forty four, like once we once four great points came out, we I think that was a really important record for us as far as transitioning into yeah. something that was a little bit different than even the f- t- two or three releases that, that came before it. Um, well, if it makes sense, like even, even the color scheme, right. Cause, cause like there was these yeah. you know, really like, you know, beautiful, gorgeous, like kind of earth Tony uh, covers uh, previously. And then it's like, it's like, Oh, that's, that's a very, that's a vibrant green. Like that's like right there. Yeah. No, like the, everything about it just sort of was, just a big change. We don't. They, we just were again like didn't want to fall into uh, typecast ourselves or sort of become a cover band to our own imagery or our own music. So yeah. we just sort of and 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 that that record, uh, you know, like uh, I, uh, someone I think it was it was an interview we did for Italy for the for the revisionist record. But they asked me if I if I could choose of the records that I've put out, like which uh, from each band, like which record it would be. And I think for road for, for, for June of 44, it would definitely be four great points. Um, that's my favorite of our five or six releases. And I think in shipping news, yeah. what would it be for shipping news? It, it, the, the last two just kill me. I love the fly at the field records and I really love the, uh, the, um, uh, one no one less heartless to fear the live record, but I think that 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 that's more of a spiritual record for me in my brain. But um, but yeah, uh, you know, the, the 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 those were sort of that moment where for both of those records for for me creatively were that were, were records that sort of capture the sort of like the the broader sort of like integrity and sort of in, in, intention of those those projects you know they just sort of hold on to the yeah. that 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 the specific energy that is immediately related to the to the time and and to to the place where those records were made well shipping news especially had a unique ability to be very intimate and then immediately expansive at the same time and that's uh that can be a hard a hard needle to thread uh, and there's certainly other bands that have that have done it, but I think that there was a, a certain specific thing of uh, with that band that you know there's a lot of heart to it. <laughs> like not to not to put too yeah. fine a point on. Now, I'm not saying that like these other bands are heartless necessarily, but like it's it's it was like a deep a deep uh, emotionality emotionality sure to, to yeah it. That's, that's that's a good word that's a good word um, yeah I, I think a lot that we. 
I, I I'm not really I, you know I I don't know how that we we end up spinning spinning it in that direction how it ended up going that way I think a lot of that initially was like a certain a, a little bit like of a fearless sort of like uh, approach to vocals and like just actually singing um, more than just sort of like our regular spoken sort of shouting narratives and all that kind of stuff but also musically and sonically like the you know the the collection initially of me and, and Kyle and Jason just the way that we talked and the way we related to each other sort of just was more indicative of I guess the the, the music that we you know it had that sort of like content like the, our relationships with each other much more personal at the front end uh, than than June of 44 for sure because you know I, I, we talked about this last time like we were June of 44 would get together and we would just bash it out you know yeah. and then we would leave each other for <laughs> You know, months on end. Right, you whereas, just get it, get it all out in like one. <laughs> yeah. What one big session, and yeah, that's good. That's gonna have a very different vibe than something that is allowed to kind of, you know, grow. Just, you get the, yeah, the just, growth chart on the wall where you you mark the child's height, right? <laughs> well, that that and also that <laughs> we've got one of those, by the way. Right. Uh, but no, good. The, that's awesome. For, for June of forty four, and we get it. We're, but we're actually getting, getting shorter. No, the um. <laughs> Uh, the, the, but the thing is, is like the other part of it is that just the approach to writing, like, like in shipping news, we, we really never, I think we only made one record in a proper studio. Like we were recording all that stuff at home or at at, at Jason's house, Jason and Kyle's house in Louisville. So there was just a much more, much more intentionally paced and much more, uh, patient sort of approach to making our records than with June of 44. And I think, I think that, that, that is, that is present in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the outcome. I think actually like I was listening, I don't listen to my records very often, but I, I think like I was, you mentioned cardiac Atlas a moment ago and I was listening to it. Uh, the, the, um, the test pressing for the record maybe two months ago i was like there's some there's some kind of like weird shipping news moments going on in june of 44 on this song yeah 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 like almost like like sneakily (laughs) like subtle 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 subterfuge that was like the guitar tones and sort of the pace of the song and just sort of like not it just the there's a lot of patient a much more patient it's a much more patient version of that song i think the you know that was something that we that we and ship the, the shipping needs band always really tried to exercise was just sort of like there's no hurry and it never like, sounded we don't need... rushed yeah that's a good yeah because it never because yeah. some and some bands like you know like being rushed is like the point right you're like, <laughs> like yeah there's just like a minor no... threat that was like super deliberate maybe might, <laughs> might not right. work the same way <laughs> <laughs> although now i kind of want to hear that but you know it's no, no, totally totally shipping news um, is very patient music and 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 uh, you know we did i don't want to belabor the point too much because we did talk about it last time but I feel like even with the packaging and presentation, like the whole thing, uh, you know, and I'm thinking of the, R- the RMSN. Ugh. Oh, the seven, the the single, like the, the single, the sewn packages. This is the stuff that's sewn in, where it's, it was like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> like no, it was the, a bad move. You know, like the first one of the, the first one of the. I wouldn't say bad. I would say bold, but bold, yeah, bold. No, bad in terms of just like, like. Uh, like bad for your skeletons to actually hand so two thousand <laughs> papery poster I, insert CD folder things. I, I appreciate the labor intensive nature of it, but I can uh, also fully game know, respect game on that. It was a it was a it was, it was the first one of those the first one of those shipping news records was really the, those papery hand sewn deals was pretty pretty interesting. We we were living in Chicago. We were just we were. Um, Right at pretty much Division in Ashland, uh, right in the middle of, I guess, at the edge of Wicker Park before Ukrainian Village. And we were, we finished the recording for that and I'd printed the, the papery pieces and we were getting, we were, we had a weekend plan to have like 15 people come over to our tiny apartment to help us put them all together. Um, and then on that Tuesday, 
uh, before we were going to put them all together, the two planes flew into the World Trade Tower. And all in September 11th, just fucking, it, it happened, and everybody, we, you know, everybody just kind of was just like pinned at home, and you know, I could, was walking down the hallway of my house, and I was looking out the window, just looking at the Sears Tower, just wondering if, if that was yeah, next. And then I was like, "There's nobody's going to fly an airplane into the Sears Tower. That's not going to happen. That doesn't happen." It was just, still, I was just watching. But you but, can um, academically know something, and still also you know, have that anxiety and just sort of, especially yeah. back then, it's hard to describe it. It was a, it was a different world pretty much. Yeah. Precisely. Precisely. Everything I was, was worried shifting. about Bart. I was like, nobody's freaking blown up Bart, but, you know. Nobody <laughs> blown, but still it's a, it's a, it's a worthy concern. Yeah. Um, but anyway, like we were, I, you know, we, on the, before, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday happened and I wrote or called everyone. And I just said, you know, if you can't come over to make this happen, if you need to kind of do your own thing, just let, we, we can just cancel. You know, yeah. we just don't need you to come over and help us hand. So everybody showed up. Everybody needed it. Everybody yeah, it, came it to my house. It was something to focus on. It was something to. It's exactly, yeah. exactly. Something to work on. So it actually just turned out to be a really beautiful couple of days where we just stayed in the house and talked to each other and listened to music and put together music packages. It was really awesome. Can, can you speak a little bit to how you came to do uh dexterity press was it something was it these types of projects that kind of like led to that being like well why don't i just do more of this was that natural outgrowth did you have like a mindset of like hey i've got this this thing envisioned i want to make it happen like what the, the um with i with, met john and matt who ran fireproof press uh, which is the first letterpress company that I worked for. Yeah, I met Arab them. Press, yeah. yeah, I met them in in, in Kansas City when, uh, which is where I met my wife as well. But we, uh, 1990, 1990 uh, was when we met. 1990, 90, and 91. John was in um, the cocktails uh, with oh, Archer yeah. Pruitt Great and Mark brilliant. Greenberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, and uh, me too. Um, and we became we became fast friends and. I just love the love those guys, and uh, they graduated and moved. Matt and John moved the printing press to Chicago and um, started working on all kinds of just like smaller projects and uh, just getting their feet wet. And then ninety two or ninety three happened, and that, I think maybe it was ninety one. They worked their their first big record was that at Action Park. It was the first shellac record, or maybe it was the tortoise record. I think tortoise came before that. It was the tortoise record. But anyway, I um, when Carrie and I moved, uh, when we when when Carrie and I moved to Chicago, I had just finished the first uh, June of forty four record and was looking for less. Uh, I was looking for an interesting way to package the record uh, that wasn't all plasticky. And I loved the way that the things that came out of John and Matt's studio look. Everything that came out of Fireproof, I was like, I just yeah. really, 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 really a, a huge fan and admirer of their work. And uh, just walked, took, you know, walked in and sat down with some, you know, with, at that point, everything was done with mechanical artwork. I had a piece of paper and pens and photocopies and just started taping everything up and pay, on paste up board. And uh, they hired me um, uh, maybe three, four weeks later. They hired me to work at the at the studio. And that was sort of the beginning of sort of my interest uh, in, in, in the process of, 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 of letterpress. That was the beginning of just sort of like getting getting into it. And then it just became sort of a consistent job for me for the spaces in between touring and making things or those sorts of deals um but you know but there was but it was really relaxed and i just felt it, 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 there's just some sort of like importance to uh to the medium and just sort of like preserving some a, a relatively extinct and archaic printing process and the machines were attractive to me the whole thing um and it almost seemed just, to sort of preface the modern uh the modern aesthetic of, of, you know, you're not necessarily mass producing a hundred thousand of the same thing. You're making something that human hands touched each, each piece of, and that's a special thing for people to have. 
Yeah, and you said it. Um, I think it was you said it just a moment ago. Like you know, like you would see those records and you would just be want to have it just because of the cover. You like right. it's like a book. It's like a, it's like you just like look at that. You Match stick, have that. So, matchbook. You know. Yeah, <laughs> like, all oh, that man, stuff. So it's awesome. like the interest in the aesthetics of the just like that the hands-on sort of thing, the, the handmade and all of that tactile quality of letterpress was just really attractive to me just personally and that translates you know i think that translates as far as just like when you see an lp or a, a cd on a shelf that's made it, w- w- with w- with that process but um yeah and we moved carrie and I, I stopped at fireproof in 98 when carrie and i moved to uh philly for her to go to graduate school and when we moved back um, fireproof had pretty much dissolved to just basically doing repressings um, of like records of, of larger larger girth. Like I, I moved back in the I moved back and John had a five thousand piece repressing of an action park and then a tortoise repressing. And, yeah. Uh, within a matter of year, like within like a couple within a year of that, I just decided like and John decided that it didn't make really that much sense for him just to be handing me these repressings and not he never even would see the job i'd be going to pick up the packages and print on the packages take them to the die cutter uh and then take them to drop them off at um at touch and go or wherever or take them to ups or whatever it was which you know we just it wasn't really it was just like i'm just going to start a business and i'll absorb whatever work that john you know i'll just start doing it myself so that's the beginning of Dexterity Press. And for the first 10 years, uh, the shop was in business uh, from 2001 through 2010. Uh, I'd never, all we worked on at the studio was other people's things. I would work on or my own records, but I never really treated the shop like uh, like a, like an art studio. It was more of a, a production press. I was working right. on large scale packaging projects or um Additioning fine art for uh, one of our bigger clients is a, is a gallerist that's in Tokyo, and we just addition artwork for them. So a lot of those sorts of things were happening. But was really what was really great about the print shop for when uh, for when we moved to the Northeast was that you know I'd already established a studio space for it. We just basically pulled the press off of the truck and put it into a studio here, and I just <laughs> just started up started working immediately, but. Hit the ground Carrie, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we carry, well, there was no time not to, you know. But Carrie, like, I think I was working on a thing for um, the swell season. It was a uh, the first thing we printed in our studio in New Haven was a poster series for that band, the Swell Season, which was pretty fun. But um, she, Carrie, Carrie compelled me and like pushed me to sort of start utilizing the studio as a as an art space as well. Just you know. And just started making my own things there, and it couldn't have come at a better time. You know, I just started making all kinds of my own print work uh, alongside all of the, you know, the regular work that we had at the studio. I mean, albeit not a, not as much because you know I just would try to fit art projects in between actual paid gigs. But as you know, as we proceeded, the uh, the art stuff started to generate a modest stream of income as well, just selling prints for like 20 30 40 bucks not like a ton of money but you know signed edition sort of things um but yeah it's a it's it 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 was extremely consistent and it's been extremely like generous as far as like allowing me the luxuries to sort of like kind of come and go from it um and interestingly like we were in um we, we when we returned from uh, recording the vocals and mixing or not mixing but recording vocals and just doing all the uh, overdubs and stuff for the revisionist record at the beginning of middle of January I came home and I you know I had work set up for the studio through August through now so I was seven or eight months out with like LP jackets and uh, stuff for myself. It just had consistent work all the way through now. But like with the pandemic, about 80% of that just disappeared by the beginning of May. Oof. I mean, it literally, it was so <laughs> yeah. fucking nuts. It was so crazy. Like I had, you know, I had everything that was out in front of me for when I got home. I was six, I had, you know, essentially 
like four or five weeks of production work before I was going to be able to even touch any new jobs. And by the time I got done with all of the production work and everything that was already in the space, like I only had about 15 or 20 percent of those jobs left. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it was really, really scary. It was scary through, I want to say through mid-June, beginning of July. Uh, but everything just came back with a vengeance. And fortunately, like we didn't get Carrie, Carrie we, 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 you know, we followed pandemic protocols and she we, we, we established our stay at home rules and for the kids and yeah. how we were going to homeschool and all that kind of stuff. And it was actually uh, it was actually not such a bad thing to be sort of a little bit loose during that time, because uh, I just wanted to focus on my children to make sure that they weren't. Yeah coming unhinged i mean you it's know, wild or, of the times is for adults i mean i, I couldn't even fathom well i just yeah i mean i don't want to care i don't want to care you know 100 out of my control there's nothing i can do it's not right. my failure all i can do is not stress and i the last thing i want to do is if even if i was stressed is bring that to my kids because they i don't want them to feel like I don't want them to feel like, you know, like I was feeling in, in April. I don't want that to translate. Right. Uh, so I just did my best to keep smiles on their faces. And, uh, and, 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 and they did a pretty good job of keeping me in line as well. You know, just, they're just, they were just uh, a whole lot of resilience going on. But, um, I was really, I mean, given that and that said, by the time, you know, early July hit and everything just started to pour back in. I just got, I was just, I was really ready. You know, I just didn't want to feel like, um, like, you know, the past 20 years of running the shop, which just basically just dissolved completely because, you know, out of the pandemic, I just wasn't ready for that. So. Uh, understandable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. you've certainly put a smile on my face as well, Jeff, and it's it's been a pleasure to have oh, you. Oh, terrific! Talking. It's uh, it's been wonderful. Yeah, Thank you. Yep. I uh, really appreciate talking to you, hearing about everything. I can't remember if we did this last time, but even if we did, the answer may be different. But I, end of the show, I ask people, why do you do what you do? Uh, I don't really have a choice. It's just sort of something I. Uh, it's, it's like a circuitous question. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's just a matter of like, I'm, I, I, I just, there's certain things that, that in the back of my brain that I just would have to push out of my system. I just have to get it out of there. So yeah, I think it's more just a matter of sort of just like exposing myself, I suppose. Well, I can't believe I'm that, saying this sentence, mm. but I'm glad you exposed yourself. <laughs> oh, well, not like that. Not like that. <laughs> Uh, uh, ew. Well, okay, great. Uh, and that's beautiful. On that note. <laughs> All right, Conan. Thank you so much, man. And you and listen, let's catch up again sometime soon. Yeah, uh, we'll, we will make it two years for the next one. And uh, I, I really appreciate your time. And uh, stay safe, man. All right, man. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. All right, brother. Bye. Oh, there he goes, Jeff Mueller, the cool guy. Great having that dude on. Um, that is a dude that has done a lot of stuff <laughs> in a very in a good way. Uh, DexterityLetterPress.com Can you hear me now? for uh, all his uh, excellent excellent work. Juno44.bandcamp.com. Uh, that's that revisionist ad- adapt- uh, adaptations and future histories in the time of love and survival. Uh, we mentioned the Rodan record that is uh, also available on Bandcamp, the Hat Factory. Rodan93.bandcamp.com. And uh, of course, there's also the. Uh, 15 quiet years, uh, shipping news, all that good stuff. Anyway, we're out of time, folks. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. The name of the show is Conan Your Transportonic Reversal. Thank you very much for listening to it. This is my farewell transmission. The show airs Thursday. 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific, RadioNope.com. 
say yes to no. Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. Stay tuned for a Juno 44 special. Music on with music off for live listeners. Protonicreversal.com for the archives. Patreon.com slash Protonicreversal to get new episodes of the show sooner. One dollar a month will get you there. Thank you so much to everyone uh, passing the show around, sharing it with friends, sharing it with an enemy. Whatever. It all counts. Uh, It all helps. Thank you. This microphone turns sound into electricity. Episode 202. That's right. You hear me now? You heard me. Out on Stay safe. 128, you're dark and lonely. Take it easy. I got my radio Take on. it easy. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? If there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day.
Radio. <laughs>